start the recording. Um, let's see. And we have just a few reminders before we get started. Um, we do want to ensure welcoming and safe space for all of our members and therefore the Carpentries Code of Conduct does apply to this session. Uh, and I'd like to remind you also to please keep your microphone muted when you're not speaking. Um, if you do have a question or a comment, uh, you can use the raise hand button on Zoom. Uh, you could also write hand in the chat window and um, I'll be helping Greg keep an eye on the chat window um, so we can address all of your questions and comments. Um, do be mindful of others and allow everyone to speak, especially if you've already had a chance to contribute. Um, and that's it on my end. Um, so at this point, I'm happy to hand it over to Greg. Okay. Thank you very much, Emily. And hello, everyone. It's good to see some familiar faces uh, and some new faces as well. And Mark's drawing. Um, so let me see if I can get the screen share to do what I want it to do. Okay, thumbs up if you're seeing my slides. Awesome. As I was saying to Emily earlier, um, video conferencing is much harder than data science. So, all right, my name is Greg Wilson. Um, I think some of you do know me. For those of you who don't, uh, I was co-founder of Software Carpentry. I've been a software developer for 35 years. Uh, I was a professor for three years and four months, which was three years, three months, and 29 days too long. And I'm now with the education team at our studio. None of which is particularly relevant to today's topic, which is how do you run a bloody meeting? And I've been doing this and participating in other people's meetings since I was 16 years old. It turns out to be one of the simplest and most cost-effective skills to pick up. You don't need to know very much to do this well. And doing it well means you get a lot of your day back and you get a lot more done in a lot less time with a lot less pain. So let's dive into my obviously handmade slides. Nobody's ever accused me of being a graphic designer. So first and most important thing, you do not have to invent this stuff yourself. There are people who have devoted their entire careers to running meetings, to learning how to run meetings well, to teaching how to run meetings well. And I particularly recommend the site askamanager.org. I'm seeing a couple of heads nod. If you've got any questions about how to manage human beings in the early 21st century, this is a really, really good resource. I highly recommend it. So carrying on from there, 10 simple rules. Rule number one, does there actually need to be a meeting? The answer is usually no, but we have them anyway. So if the purpose of the meeting is to inform people, send an email. The only reason to have the meeting is if you are genuinely expecting questions that are going to turn into debate. It's always more efficient for people to respond with questions in email. It gives them a chance to think, and that's particularly important if they are less confident or if they need a little bit more time to put together their question. I'm reasonably good at thinking on my feet. A lot of people prefer not to do that. And an in-person real-time meeting disproportionately favors people like me. So if the purpose is to inform, send an email. Reason number two to have a meeting is to consult. Most consultation is a sham. It's only real if people actually get a vote and that vote means something. Most of the time when you're told we're going to consult, you're actually being told what the decision is and given a chance to voice your grievances before the university goes ahead and does what it was planning to do anyway. Not that I'm bitter or anything, right? So case number two is usually case number one, treated accordingly. Third case is discussion. Absolutely have a meeting when the most efficient way to reach a decision is real-time conversation, but be mindful that that only works well in small groups or with well-defined procedural rules. You can have 200 people or 300 people in a parliamentary meeting getting things done, but it's not a free-for-all. There's a well-defined playbook and there are people whose job it is to make sure that we all follow those rules. If you haven't got that kind of training and that kind of support, I would cap a meeting at half a dozen. Anything beyond that 
And what you're going to have is half a dozen people in a meeting with a bunch of spectators or three different meetings going on in the same room, neither of which is helpful. Okay. We're going to come back to this one in a bit. Finally, if the goal of the meeting is to collaborate, that's not a meeting, right? That's a sprint. That's a hackathon. That's pair programming. Don't bill it as a meeting and don't think of it that way. Rule number two, create an agenda. If nobody cares enough to think for five minutes and make a list and circulate it, you don't need to have a meeting. Okay. And where possible, I will refuse to take part in meetings where there hasn't been an agenda circulated at least an hour in advance. I can't always do that. But most of the time, my feeling is, if you're not going to tell me what we're discussing, how can I prepare? How can I contribute if I'm walking in cold? Right. Please, if you're the one making up the agenda, estimate how much time each item is going to require. That gives people an idea of its importance. And it also forces the meeting organizer to feel, to decide whether this is realistic. I have been in meetings that have 40 agenda items for 30 minutes, right? which is rather like saying that we're going to see all of Paris in a weekend. It isn't going to happen. Why fool yourself? One other reason to drop the agenda is to prioritize. There's a tendency to clear all the simple things out of the way first to leave time for the difficult issues. That's a mistake because the simple things are never as simple as you think. They always wind up taking more time and then you're rushing through next year's budget in four minutes, having spent 30 minutes arguing over parking permits. Once you've got the agenda down, you can decide which things are going to need the most time and you put those first. Excuse me a second. <clears throat> and the final one, plan to end early. My wife said to me once that the fundamental unit of time is the bladder. And I said, I've never thought of that. And she said, you've never been pregnant. Okay. Right now, I find it difficult to sit through hour long meetings because I have back problems. 90 minutes, I'm not contributing in the last half hour. I have to get up and move around. It's a little easier to do online than it was in person, but that doesn't mean it's easy. If you book an hour meeting, plan to have 45 minutes, so it'll actually run 50, so that everybody's got time to go to the washroom, check on the kids, whatever they have to do. Please be mindful that with so many of us now working at home or under unusual circumstances, we don't have the dedicated time that we used to. A lot of us have elder care responsibilities, child care responsibilities. We can't get an hour per hour. Please allow for that. Rule number three, please have clear rules for making decisions and for knowing what decisions have been made. In the 1970s, the feminist Joe Friedman wrote a really important paper that's been cited over and over again called The Tyranny of Structurelessness. What she pointed out is that if you don't have rules, what you mean is you don't have official rules that make people accountable. Instead, what you have is an old boys or old girls network where getting things done depends on who you know and whether you will personally be listened to. If you're in an organization that frequently uses the passive voice and says, the decision has been made, then something is wrong. Decisions don't make themselves, they're made by people and it's important that everyone in the organization know partly to hold them accountable, but partly also to know who do I go to for a definitive answer on this question? Am I allowed to hire a contractor on a part-time basis who isn't a student? Well, I need to know who's responsible for making that decision to be sure that I'm getting the right answer. Okay. How do we decide whether this software is ready to ship? How do we decide who is going to be an author on this paper in a very small group where everyone knows everyone, you can get away with being informal. More than half a dozen people, you want to have some sort of process to keep yourselves honest. And this was one of the mistakes I made in the early days of software carpentry. I left it too late before formalizing the decision-making rules. For far too long, it was go ask Greg. 
which kind of works for me, except I was a bottleneck much sooner than I realized. And it also meant that a lot of people who weren't comfortable just barging into my email didn't have a chance compared to people who were more extroverted, more confident, or just more willing to take a risk. The standard set of rules for making decisions in English language parliamentary democracies is called Robert's Rules. It's also used by many business organizations, trade unions, and so forth. If you need Robert's Rules, you probably need some training. This is what you use if you're running the US Senate or the British Commons. There is a much smaller, much simpler set of rules that evolved in the 1970s that I recommend instead. It's known as Martha's Rules. And I'm gonna take a couple of minutes to go through them now because if you've got an organization large enough that there are disagreements and you occasionally have to take votes, this is probably what you should be using. Part one, every proposal has a sponsor. So um, Ariel, can I pick you just for an example? Okay, so Ariel has an idea. She writes it up as a two page, maximum two page proposal. And we'll talk a little bit about what goes into those proposals, but basically, it's to clarify her own thinking so that we know what we're actually deciding. One of the projects that I'm involved in, we use GitHub issues for this. Right? It's got a subject line. It's got a very brief description of the problem we're trying to solve or the opportunity we're trying to take advantage of. There's a concrete specific proposal about what we're going to do. And then there's some discussion of the alternatives and why we're not pursuing them. If you need a second page of piece of paper to print it out, it's too long. Okay. So, those all have to be available to meeting participants at least a day before the meeting so that people have a chance to look at them and ask questions. In the meeting itself, when Ariel presents her proposal, we immediately have a sense vote. Everybody is thumbs up, indifferent, or thumbs down. If everybody is thumbs up or indifferent, the motion passes with no further discussion. If anybody is opposed, we then have a moderated 10 minute discussion set a timer, have a moderator who isn't participating, but is just making sure that everybody gets heard. And at the end of that, you have a straight up or down vote. If the majority is in favor, the proposal passes. This works very well for groups of up to a few dozen people who mostly agree most of the time. It doesn't work well for adversarial groups which is why it's not used by, for example, city council, where you typically have factions that have fundamental disagreements. It's just not an appropriate set of rules. But for research labs, for open source projects, for a lot of the sorts of things that we're involved in, we have found that Martha's rules are very effective, very easy to learn. And crucially, those little proposals mean that the next person to join can look back and say, why the hell are we doing things this way? oh, there was this other factor that I didn't take into account that they considered that meant that the obvious answer wasn't the right one. It leaves a trail so that your successors or your future self can figure out why you did things. And just a brief recap of what goes into those two pages. The abstract, right, three or four sentences, and please, no teasers. Don't say, we will discuss. I should be able to read the abstract and know what you are proposing and whether or not I believe in it. Background problem statement, the actual proposal, budget and resources required, an FAQ including alternatives if that's appropriate, and I typically include a few bullet points at the bottom with any interesting aspects of the history of a proposal if it's one that's been running on for a while. But again, these can be very, very short. Think about a typical issue in GitHub. One of the advantages of putting them into GitHub or something like that is it gives you a natural place for threaded discussion. You don't have to flood the mailing list or Slack. You can say those who are interested, come over here and start appending comments to this issue. So rule number four for meetings, put somebody in charge. Okay. The moderator or the conductor should not be doing most of the talking any more than the conductor in the orchestra plays all of the notes. Their job is to make sure that everybody is getting a chance to be heard and that everybody is being respectful. So typically they will call on people in a particular order. They will typically allow one point at a time. 
if uh, I'm, I'm going to pick on Mark, if Mark pops up and says, well, I've got several things I want to say, the moderator's immediate response should be great. Give us the first one and then we'll go around the table to see who else has things. And then if you still want to make your second point, we'll come back to you. You don't get an enormous backlog because then you've got several parallel discussions trying to happen at once. This is the moderator's job. We play one song at a time. It really helps if the moderator or a note taker is keeping a backlog. Typically in the Etherpad or a shared Google Doc or something like that, you've got the running list of who still wants to speak. And as we'll see in a moment, possibly which topic they want to address so that you can make sure that you're focusing on one but not losing track of the others. It's very difficult to do all of that and participate meaningfully in the meeting. Often we do because we don't have externals who can serve as moderators. But honestly, one of the kindest things you can do for a friend is to offer to be a moderator for their meeting if they'll be a moderator for yours. Right? And I am happy to swap off time like this because it allows the people who need to make the decisions to focus on the decision making, not on keeping count of how many times various people have spoken. Rule number five should probably be rule number one because all of the other rules are actually special cases of this. Right? When I say require politeness, I actually go a little bit further. You know, I, I require kindness. Right? Again, a lot of the meetings that we take part in have people who are perhaps more introverted, for whom English may not be a first language, who may be feeling imposter syndrome, They've got good ideas. They're just not as assertive as I might be about expressing them. I'm a middle-aged straight white guy, right? I have been listening to the sound of my own voice for far too long, right? The meeting should not be run on the assumption that I'm typical. So having a code of conduct is essential. Training people to leave a little bit of space for others to speak is equally essential. Calling people out when they are dismissive or condescending is equally essential. Learning how to be productive in a meeting isn't just learning the rules, it's learning how to make space for people. It's learning how to play with other musicians, if you'll permit the analogy. Right? And it's a teachable, learnable skill. Um, I am fairly strict about a rule for in-person meetings that all devices have to go in politeness mode. For those who aren't familiar with the term, it means that your phone is turned face down, that your laptop is closed. Obviously you make an exception for people with assistive technology, or if there are family needs, there may be people who have to be reachable at all times. But by and large for an in-person meeting, it will be over faster if people aren't trying to multitask. We can't enforce this rule for online meetings but we'll be talking about that in a few minutes. Uh, another firm rule is no interruptions. And this is often the hardest to enforce because some people, and I'm one of them, will hear the first two or three sentences. And then when the speaker pauses to take a breath, they will take that as a signal to jump in. And working online makes this even worse. So I am trying hard right now to train myself to pause for at least one full breath before I speak. Because that way, if Hendrik or Kevin or Kyla aren't finished talking, they can carry on without being interrupted. Uh, no rambling. This again is up to the moderator. If you feel that somebody hasn't thought things through before speaking, feel free to jump in and say, why don't we give you a moment to condense your thoughts We'll call on another speaker and we'll come back to you. It is not something you would do at a dinner party. It is not something you would do in social conversation, but meetings are neither of those. And if somebody is taking three minutes to get to the point in a meeting of 10 people, they've just wasted half an hour of human time. And that's not courteous. And yeah, you do have a code of conduct, right? Good. Item number six, record the minutes. Most people aren't aware that Joseph Stalin was actually the general secretary of the Communist Party, not the president of the Soviet Union. 
if you are the one who is making up the agenda and keeping the minutes, you are actually the one in charge. Right? Why do you do this? Number one, you need to know that people who weren't there can find out what happened. None of us are going to be able to make all meetings, particularly not under the current circumstances. Equally important is you want the people who were there to agree on what happened or on what was proposed or on what was settled or on what they promised. I have often looked at the minutes of a meeting I was in and immediately fired off an email saying, no, I didn't actually promise that or that's not actually what I was proposing. I've equally had people come back to me to say that I missed something or that I misinterpreted something. It's usually not ill will. It's usually a case of trying to juggle too many things, trying to move too fast, trying to, you know, there's a hundred reasons why you can get it wrong. But if you're taking minutes, which you should, you want to make sure they're right. right? Finally, you do want people to be held accountable at later meetings. Right? If you promised to do something two weeks ago, I want to be able to check today. Again, it's not because I'm trying to be authoritarian. It's because I will have forgotten what you said you were going to do. And if you did it two weeks ago, immediately after the meeting, you might forget to tell us that it's been done. And it's really frustrating to go into a meeting doing something and then have somebody put up their hand and say, oh, I sorted that out two weeks ago. Again, GitHub issues or wiki pages are a good way to manage this. Right? Just tag a wiki page to say, this is the minutes from this meeting. Here's who was present. Here are the things we discussed. And here's what we all agreed to do. Link, link, link to the particular issue so you can see which are open and closed. It's not the ideal workflow tool, but it's one a lot of us are using anyway, and it's good enough. Just in the chat, can I ask how many of you use the three stickies method in meetings? Amy's never heard of it. Tobin doesn't? Okay. So, this was done to me in my second startup to get me to shut up. Okay? It was absolutely essential and I learned a lot from it. Here's what you do. At the start of the meeting, everybody gets three sticky notes or three poker chips or three jelly beans, three tokens. Every time you speak, it costs you a token. When you're out of tokens, you are not allowed to talk until everyone has used at least one. This ensures that nobody's speaking more than three times as often as the quietest person in the meeting, and it completely changes the tone of the meeting. What researchers have found is that most meetings are dominated by two people. Two voices take up most of the airtime, and they are not always the two that know the most or that have the most to discuss. They are the two that are most assertive. There's some people, and I was one, I still am sometimes, who act as if no matter how large the meeting is, they should be talking half the time. And you've been in meetings with people like me. This trick is to regulate people like me. It is to make space for people who are quieter so that they have an opportunity to be heard. And guess what? Their ideas are just as good. They're just not as forceful about pushing them into the conversation. I have seen grown men pull $20 bills out of their wallet trying to buy a sticky note because they're jonesing for the sound of their own voice. And across the table, there's a woman, and yes, it usually is a man and a woman, who's sitting there with the three sticky notes going, nope, I'm not going to say anything because I want you to know how it feels. Right? It would be straightforward to add something like this to things like Slack and mailing lists. And in fact, Eight years ago, I proposed a bounty for the Piper Mail mailing list system that Python uses so that you could throttle messages. In a non-programming group that I'm part of, we have a strict rule, one message per person per topic per day, and it has made a huge difference to our productivity and to our inclusivity. Because it used to be that you would wake up in the morning, you would go and check the mailing list and there'd be 85 messages back and forth between three people that have gone down a rabbit hole and your reaction would be, I, just, I give up. I can't catch up. I can't keep up. I'm going to opt out of the conversation. 
As soon as you've got a throttle, people have to stop and think before firing off that next message, and it makes room for other people. Another trick you can use is interruption bingo. And again, I learned this when it was done to me. Start of the meeting, you drop a bingo card. Everybody's name goes on each row and each column. And every time X interrupts Y, you add a check mark to that box. And what you will see very quickly is that the same two or three people are doing all of the interrupting. And the same two or three people are the ones being interrupted all the time. And it has everything to do with perceived social status, not with knowledge. After 15 minutes, you hold up the bingo card and say, okay, we need to fix this. Most people will adjust their behavior once they realize what they're doing. Those who don't, well, you just learned something useful as well, didn't you? Right. Managing all of this is part of the moderator's job and is another good reason to have an external moderator because both of these strategies can be seen as confrontational by the people on the receiving end. It's certainly how I felt. Having somebody outside the group who is recognized as being there to keep things flowing smoothly makes this kind of feedback a lot easier for people to accept. And finally, I highly recommend the NOAA site on dealing with disruptive behaviors. It's, it's lots of fun. I, you know, if they had done these as hex stickers, I would probably have half a dozen on my laptop by now, but there's just not room for squares on my laptop. Right. This is a nice little catalog of the kinds of behaviors that you will see and effective strategies for dealing with them. Rule number eight, it's not just the moderator. You should be an active participant. Most of the people in an orchestra are playing instruments. They're not the conductor. So how do you do this? Decline invitations. Right. The three most beautiful words in English are not, I love you. The three most beautiful words in English are not my problem. Right? If you've been invited to a meeting and you look at the agenda and you say, nope, I'm okay, I don't need to be there, then tell people that. Small meetings will be shorter and they will accomplish more. However, you only get to do this if you are willing to live with whatever the meeting decides. If you've opted out of attending, and they have a vote and it goes away you don't like, that's on you, not on them. So you do know to read the agenda of the material before the meeting so that you know what you might be missing. I find it very helpful to take my own notes during meetings. It makes me look smart. If I'm jotting down a few things about questions I might want to ask or points I want clarified and then crossing them off as other people ask questions and I get those answers, when it's my turn to speak, I know exactly what I want to say, and it's something that hasn't already been covered. That helps. Uh, I try to use participants' names. It makes things friendlier. It also, I think, makes it clear whose attention I'm requesting. Pausing before speaking, I've already spoken about that. Right? Pause for a breath to organize your thoughts, but also in case the other person hadn't actually finished. And feel free to put down your hand. If you've raised your hand to ask a question and somebody else has asked it or the speaker has gotten to it, taking down your hand, no, I don't actually have an issue, carry on. Again, you don't have to talk if you don't have something to say. So how does this all change for online? Uh, I strongly suggest that you never have mixed mode meetings. Either you're all in person or you're all remote. And if you've got five people in the building and one who's remote, go find some cubbies and do it as a remote meeting because otherwise the external person is excluded. It's very, very difficult to run mixed mode meetings. This might change as we all become more familiar with life online. I mean, I don't know if you've seen the stat, but there have been more, there's been more online meetings and online teaching in the last six months than in the entire previous human history. If you just count human hours, we've done more of this stuff since COVID hit than we did from the dawn of time to the start of 2020. And we're probably gonna do more in the fall semester than we've done in all of human history up till the present moment. So we're learning a lot about how to do this, but for the moment, keep it simple. 
Um, second point here, please don't record the meeting without willing consent. And willing consent is the important part here. If you say to people, I'm going to record the meeting, and they have to raise their voice to opt out, that's not willing consent. I'm comfortable being recorded online, but if you've ever had to deal with harassment or a stalker, the idea that video of yourself might get out on the interwebs is pretty scary and it excludes a lot of people. Um, please review the meeting protocol at the start, you know, as we did at the start of this meeting. You know, if you want to raise your hand, here's how you do it. If you want to ask a question, here's where it goes. If it's the same group of people over and over again, you can just dive in. But again, a lot of the meetings we have, it's either different groups each time or first timers. When I'm teaching, I take a moment or two at the beginning to tell people where various buttons are in Zoom, just to be sure that they understand where do they find this. It's amazing how many people are left out of meetings because they don't know how to open the chat window on a mobile device. It's a shame Zoom can't afford to hire an engineer to make the UI better, but that's a separate discussion. Uh, taking minutes in a shared document. I first started using Etherpads in 2005 after seeing some of the students in one of my class taking shared notes. It's now a common practice in the carpentries. I now use Google Docs when I'm taking notes in classes that I run. Whatever it is, having something where people can see what's going on makes the meeting more accessible as well. It also gives you the rough draft of the minutes that you're going to save for later. It's unfortunate that despite repeated pleas, GitHub has not integrated some sort of real-time multi-author text tool. You can't do what we're doing in the Etherpad right now with a GitHub issue or a GitHub wiki page. There's no reason why it couldn't be added. And I think it would make that platform a lot more attractive. For the moment, though, we have to split it between various places and copy and paste text. Uh, raising hands digitally is good, slash hand in the chat or raising the hand icon. But something I saw recently that I am now advocating is that when you raise your hand, you add a few words about why. I want to talk about the budget, or I want to talk about the date of the next meeting, or I want to talk about whatever. That way the moderator knows which bag to put you in so that we can deal with... I. Looking at the chat, Mark, I think you meant college, not collage classroom, but I'll take it, right? So if the moderator knows why you're raising your hand, their job becomes much easier and the meeting becomes much more efficient because now we can batch up the discussion of the budget knowing that the next most popular topic is the parking permits or the travel or whatever else is on the table. I've only seen, I've only started doing this since June, but it's making a really big difference. Okay. And finally, see, seek truth, not victory. Right. I, I came home several years ago and told my wife, well, we just had the meeting with the customers and she laughed and said, who won? Right. There are a lot of meetings that degenerate into social dominance displays. Right? There are a lot of meetings that turn into somebody wanting to win the argument rather than coming to a conclusion. And I've been guilty of this a lot. I'm trying to avoid falling into that trap these days. Um, you want to avoid the well actuallys and the in-person equivalent of reply guy. For those of you who haven't run into the term reply guy, that's the one who pops up on Twitter to nitpick or tell you that well, you don't actually understand your own specialty or a or hundred different ways, right? The moderator's job is to shut this down, but it's everybody else's job to back the moderator when they do. Okay? Please, for the love of all you hold holy, don't raise points you don't actually believe in. The devil doesn't need more advocates. We don't need to drag this out. If you don't actually think that something is important or is a reasonable position, don't bring it up just for the sake of argument. Life is too short. And finally, please don't make excuses for your questions or opinions. Don't preface them with, this is probably stupid, but. Right. 
I, I am pretty sure I have asked more stupid questions and said more stupid things than most people in this meeting. I mean, statistically, I'm 57. I'm older than most of you. I've probably made a fool of myself more often than you have. And here we are. We got stuff done anyway. So please, don't apologize for it. Uh, this is a quote from Kate Hertwick. Some of you may know her through the carpentry. She works at the Fred Hodge Cancer Institute in Seattle. She looked over my slides for me, and this was her response. Once you know how to do this, the real struggle is sitting still while other people flail around ineffectively. Right? Once you know how to play music, it's really painful to listen to people singing out of tune. The good thing is, in most cases, if you have a chance to run a meeting and you show people how to do it well, they will be grateful and they will start doing it themselves. It spreads really fast. The reason we have bad meetings is most of us have never had a chance to see one that's run well. And a well-run meeting is a beautiful thing. I learned how to do this from my dad, and it was one of the most useful things he ever taught me. So, what I would like to do, now that I'm finished what I wanted to say, is ask the more important question, and it's one that I ducked in the discussion of Martha's rules. Now you know how to run a meeting, but we've left out the most important question. Who gets to vote? In the groups that you're part of, who actually has a say in decisions? In lab groups, it's effectively often the PI. There might be discussion, there might be consultation, but at the end of the day, the PI is making the decision. That's okay. I work for a company. At the end of the day, our CEO has final say over things, and above him, the board. That's great. With the carpentries, you get to vote for people who are then the ones who hold the various staff members accountable. That's great. I understand that system. But I'm part of several open source projects right now where it's really not clear to me who gets to make what decisions? The person who started it? Yeah. But, but who else? And for several years in the early days of Python, it wasn't clear who was allowed to decide what other than Guido Van Rossum. And that led to a lot of paralysis because Guido didn't have time to look at, any, at everything, but it wasn't clear who else was responsible for what. Once the Python Software Foundation was set up, once people understood who gets to make the call, things started to flow a lot better. So, um, I would be interested in hearing from all of you. I'm going to end the screen share now, if I can. For the groups that you're part of, does anybody want to tell us how you decide who gets a voice? How new people are added to that pool? And if necessary, how are people dropped from that pool? I've had to kick people out of organizations for disruptive behavior. I've been part of organizations that decided to split more or less amicably because we just couldn't come to consensus. How do you all do this? Anybody want to jump in? Greg, you have a hand. Sure, Tobin, Tobin please. Hi, um, I'm going to talk specifically about um, the Research Data Access and Preservation Association. Um, I'm the current past president, but last year I was the president. And um, most of, mostly we have a, a board, an executive board that's elected and then um, a leadership team that's composed of the executive board and then people who are leading committees mm -hmm. that make the decisions. So the executive board kind of is the central deciding factor, um, but often we have issues where we don't feel like we can only make the decision. So we bring in the leadership team mm -hmm. and then there's other decisions where we bring in the entire community and usually have them vote by surveys. And okay. this is all conducted by like monthly meetings with the smaller groups. Okay, follow up question. When you say people vote for that executive, who gets to vote? Uh, members of the professional association. Okay. So they've signed up, are they dues paying members some sort of qualification criteria to become a member? They will be dues paying as of next year, but since we didn't have a lot of infrastructure, it's free right now. Okay. That's great. So, so the electorate there is very well defined. There are, you know, there's a list of people who have opted in. Yep. That's great. Okay. Uh, Mark Lofferswiler, please. 
Um, what we do here at the library is if it's, if it's a group that's going to have to have things that would affect policy or those types of things, we do a charter for the group meeting group as to who would be the members and what their roles would be. And so usually that then defines the voting block and it also defines the people who would be in the meeting, but it's something that then gets vetted, vetted up through our senior team so that management knows about it. It's a great record keeping thing. So they don't have to know exactly what every group is doing, but they know the name of the group, what's their purpose and who are the members. Okay, cool. Dan McCloy, please. Yeah, so for the open source project that I work on, there is really no defined or articulated structure. So there's a loose group of maybe half a dozen to 10 um, of the core developers who know what each other's specialties are. And so if a new um, enhancement proposal comes up, they'll sort of, you know, at mention that person and say, hey, you deal with this one because it's within your wheelhouse. But if there's any disagreement, there's no well-defined process for how to how to manage the disagreement. And I've been part of many groups like that. And it works well as long as everything is working well. Right? But as, as I'm sure you already know, it can be really hard for newcomers to break in, particularly people who aren't very self-confident. Right? So you're losing, and, and this comes back to the work of people like Igor Steinmacher, who spent the last 15 years discover, studying how people become contributors to open source projects. And I'll throw his name in here because I've learned a ton from reading his research. Um, if it isn't clear how to become one of that inner circle, you don't even try, which, which means you're losing a lot of potentials. Um, it, it's also the case that when there is acrimony or when one of those key players has moved on, it's not clear who's supposed to pick that up or who decides who's supposed to pick that up. Um, I don't know for how many people have seen the announcement about TidyBlocks, which is a scratch-like tool for doing data science. We just relaunched it this Monday. I'm very excited I'm part of the project. One of the things we have to do in the next couple of weeks is formalize all of this so that people who want to come in and contribute translations or new blocks or new examples understand who is going to decide whether their work gets included or not. Because many of them, it turns out, are going to be first time contributors to open source and they're really nervous about this. They think you have to have a PhD in computer science before you can contribute to a little open source project. We need to make it explicit that you don't, and here's how you go about it. Other hands, other people who are part of what's, what have people seen go wrong in this respect? I've talked about some of the failings. I'm sure we've all seen meetings or groups that went sour. Anybody want to talk about some of those? I'm seeing some heads nod. Ariel, please. Yeah, I was, I was kind of wondering what your thoughts were on having like weekly sync up meetings with their team or like every other week sync ups because I think in some of the teams I'm on it's always trying to find the balance of if we don't meet there's all this other stuff that we're doing that we're forgetting to communicate with each other but sometimes if we do meet too often we're running out of things to say and kind of finding that balance. I like having bi-weekly meetings to maintain the social contact and familiarity and friendliness because so much of an effective team is person-to-person -person trust, or at least familiarity. You've got to know your neighbors. And email doesn't really do that. Right? And it's a lot easier now that so many of us are using tools like Zoom anyway. Obviously, we have to be careful not to exclude people who are in low bandwidth environments or disadvantaged because of time zones. Uh, is there anybody in this call right now who's up in the middle of the night? Right. Okay. It is the middle of the night in Australia right now. Right. And if you talk to Australians, people in New Zealand, people in Indochina, they will tell you that they're excluded over and over again, because if they want to take part, they got to be awake at two in the morning. And again, if I could roll back to when I was the executive director of software carpentry, I would have followed up on a suggestion that one of our Australian colleagues made 
which was to rotate the meeting forward eight hours every month. So every three months, you've got to be up in the middle of the night just to know what it feels like. Um, the regular meetings, absolutely. My wife is a project manager. She's been working from home since lockdown. And so I'm finally getting a chance to listen to her run meetings, which she does well. And one of the things that she ends with is, okay, everybody, if we have nothing in particular to discuss. Yeah, Yanina is saying on the chat, have to wake up 3 a.m. in the morning in order to North America and everybody else has to fit in around it. Yeah. I'm still here. Can you see me? Oh, I'm sorry. My wife runs a good meeting and she has regular status meetings with her group and she ends most of them by saying, okay, if there's nothing else we need to talk about, I'll give you back 20 minutes of your life. But at least then there was the opportunity, right? There was the get together and the chance. It's also a chance for people who may not want to put something into the official minutes until they've had a chance to sound everybody out. And, and there's a role for that. There, there is a place for floating trial ideas without wondering if it's going to be used against you later or be misinterpreted or misunderstood. Sorry about that. Huh? Is the connection good now? Awesome. Okay. What else have people seen go wrong? I mean, I'm tempted to ask what is the most dysfunctional thing you have ever seen happen in a meeting, but most of you wouldn't be willing to share that since we're being recorded. Sylvia, please. Um, can, you, can you hear me okay? Sit. Okay. One of the things that I, I've seen that's challenging for me to be a part of is there's a grassroots organization that I'm a part of, and I think it, it likes to think that it's non-hierarchical, but in reality, there's someone who kind of manages the group. And, and this person also has a lot to share. It has a lot of knowledge, a lot of wisdom and a lot to share. And so they end up dominating the conversation. And, and even though we come in with an agenda and with like time limits on each piece, it's very common for this person to be like, oh, are we running out of time? This happens multiple times. Yeah. Um, that's what the three stickies trick was invented for. Right. Once they've got a budget of how often they're allowed to talk, they will use up their budget almost immediately. And that makes space for other people. Um, if they're aware of the issue and willing to actually take steps to address it, something I have seen done but haven't yet done myself is for that person to go to other junior members of the organization and say, here's something that we need to discuss. I would like you to take this one. Let me take a few minutes and fill you in on the background, but you're going to be the speaker. You're going to be leading the discussion, making the points as a way to practice doing this, but also as a way for me to fade into the background. And again, for those of you with musical training, right, it's very common for the more experienced members of the band to say, okay, one of the juniors, one of the seconds is going to take the solo this time because how the hell else are you going to learn? Right? We need, you know, we need a trumpet solo. You take it. Right? So if they're willing to acknowledge the problem as a problem, that's a strategy I've seen work. I haven't tried it myself yet, but I've seen others use it. Right? Coming back into the chat, uh, Hendrik, please, ignoring self-set time limits. Yes, so I had, a, I had some meetings where we did have time uh, limits for certain blocks. And then uh, at some point, the, uh, we had this phrase, okay, we are running out of time, but this topic is too important to not do. So we just do it now. And then we, get, uh, we, we completely ran out of time and right. it was just uh, infuriating. Because okay. for some of us, it was like waiting for this block to end to come to the other blocks and for the others, it was like endless discussions. Right. If that happens in the first meeting with a new group or the first couple of meetings with a new group, 
it's perfectly understandable in the same way that if you're, you've got a group of software developers and they are wildly optimistic the first time they try to ship a piece of code about how much they'll get done, it's a learning experience. If you're still doing that the 10th time you get together, if you're not learning from the fact that you always need more time for certain things, then with respect, I might query somebody, some people's intelligence. Right? If you're always going over budget, you adjust your budget expectations. If everything always takes longer and costs more, I'm not a data scientist, but I know how to draw a, a regression line through a bunch of points, right? If everything always takes 15 minutes instead of 10, then we should plan on it taking 15 minutes. And if that means we need an extra meeting or a longer meeting, and I prefer the extra to the longer, then let's do that. But if we consistently blow out our time, we're not very smart, are we? And this is one of the reasons why if I'm taking minutes, I tend to jot down times just so I have an idea afterwards, how long did it take us to discuss these things? In the same way that when I'm on a road trip, I tend to keep track more or less of how much I'm spending on food. So the next time I travel, I know how to do a budget. Um, Sarah Lynn, please. Okay, thanks. So I've run into an interesting thing. I'm uh, president of a local library association this year and um, we come from a lot of different library types, academic, government, industry, and uh, I got, I had a, actually, and, and I, my, my experience is that I've been in uh, corporate or business law librarianship for well over a decade, um, and I'm colored, of course, by some of the reasons I left academic librarianship, one of which was just death by meetings, death by committees. Um, so I enjoy, um, and I, and full disclosure, uh, I'm a librarian at our studio and owe my job to Greg. It's a good place and to be. You don't owe your job to me. You owe your job to you. Um, so, <laughs> so, so the. Um, sorry, did. I was going to say one. An organization that I used to be part of um, had two budgets for every staff member. How much money are you allowed to spend this year, and how many hours are you allowed to spend in meetings this year? No, I'm, I'm quite serious. <laughs> Because everybody who scheduled a meeting or planned a meeting had to say, this is how much time we expect it's going to take. And other people could then say, you've blown out my budget. That doesn't mean I don't attend your meeting. It means I have to drop something else, right? If we've got $1,000 and I want to do X, it means I can't do Y. That's fine. I'm an adult. I get to make that decision. You tell me how much I've got. I decide how to allocate it. There's a statistic that really depressed me in... Ontario's public schools, I live in on Toronto, Ontario. In Ontario public schools in yeah. 1990, the average K-12 teacher spent one hour out of class on paperwork for every hour in class with students. By 2010, it was two and a half hours out of class for every hour in class with students, if they did all of the ministry paperwork. What they actually did was just not bother with the paper, was skip various reports, was just copy for last year's and not do it. Because what else could they do? There wasn't any single cause. It was incrementalism. Everybody wants one more report. Everybody needs one more piece of information. And individually, they're all important. Yes, we do need to know a bit more about nutrition for recent immigrants. Yes, we do need to know a bit more about in-class behavior of special needs kids. But all of these things for each of their owners is one more form. For the teacher, it's one more in the stack, right? And anybody who's ever been in charge of a budget knows what it's like to be nickeled and dimed to death. You don't know where the money went, but it's all gone. But if you can do it, instituting a meeting budget exactly like a financial budget is something that everybody immediately understands everybody supports in theory and everybody will fight tooth and nail against in practice at first because they're afraid their meeting is the one that will get cut what you can tell them is then let's teach people how to run meetings more efficiently so instead of taking two hours we can do it in 30 minutes right i think in um I'm going to use um, one of my action items to, to, to tell my board about Martha's rules and maybe institute some changes. Um, the challenge that I've run into is that um, the government and academic librarians um, 
are used to this, like, we'll just meet forever sort of a thing. And so when I'm like, we've got 40 minutes and like, I've got to go or we've got an hour. And so I'm sorry, I'm going to, we're going to have to table this. Or I'm going to ask you to take this discussion. There's, um, there's been hurt feelings and folks have been very upset, which was surprising. Um, but the only thing I could chalk it up to was just a sort of different culture. Um, so I think the Martha's rules will be helpful. And I, I think I'll do a lunch and learn and um, share what I've learned here today uh, in hopes yeah. to changing culture a little bit. If, if I could get business leaders to run meetings the way my mom used to run a get together of the moms who were in charge of a Girl Scout troop, the world would be a better place, right? I don't know how many of you are involved in, in things like church groups, but people who don't have a lot of time and budget but have to get stuff done, they learn how to run an efficient meeting, right? Um, question from Emily, if you've scheduled a meeting to review a particular document and the attendees haven't read it in advance, what do I advise? Call them out, right? If you obviously haven't read the document, you don't get a vote if it's my meeting. Now, sometimes I can't enforce that, right? But if you show up for a camping trip and you don't have the sleeping bag and you don't have the cooking gear and you don't have foods and you don't have a raincoat, you're not coming on the camping trip. Now, obviously you make exceptions. Right? We're trying to empathize with people. If you show up and it's the kid was sick, I didn't have a chance to do this, fair game. But if you are repeatedly showing up and you don't respect your colleagues enough to take 15 minutes over lunch to look through a couple of proposals to decide what you're doing, then I don't need to respect you. Right? It isn't just a matter of efficiency, it's a matter of respect. And one thing you can challenge these people on if the proposal had been written by the university president or the CEO, would you have found the time to read it? If their answer is no, it still wouldn't have been possible, no problem. If their answer is yes, if I had thought you were an important person, I would have found the time. Well, I just learned something about you. Right. The flip side of this is that if you're going to write up a proposal, if you're going to write up something for people to read, you have to make it short. You have to boil it down. I am frustrated beyond tears by how badly written most abstracts in computer science are. Most abstracts in the life sciences tell you what the paper has concluded, right? The home range area of penguins ranges between 200 and 250 square meters. Great. Now I can go and read and see if I believe it, but now I know what you're saying. The equivalent in computer science is we will discuss variation in home range area of certain bird species. And I'm like, I don't know anything that I didn't know before. Right? Learning how to get to the point. And I have to admit here that we trip over a lot of cultural differences. And this is a place where I need to be very careful. What I regard as efficiency is regarded as rudeness in many cultures. Right? And so you have to be respectful of that. I find that getting straight to the point in written work is far more acceptable across cultures than doing it in person or by speech. If I just pick up the phone and say, what are we going to do about X? That's considered rude. But if I do that in print, it's much more acceptable, which is again, a reason to write some of these things down. Other questions? Okay. Uh, from Toby. Is introducing these structures to meetings we attend only possible from a position of authority? Um, you have to have, well, okay, number one, does your group actually officially have an authority? The group that Dan was describing doesn't. So it's not clear whose buy-in you need or who you have to persuade. That's part of the problem that you need to fix. If you don't know who has to agree to something in order for it to have been agreed, start with that. In my experience, most people who are comfortable in their roles are quite happy to try out some of these ideas. Probably not all of them at once, but you can pick one or two and start with that, right? If people, uh, 
there's a line from the movie Primary Colors, and if you haven't seen it, please do. It's one of the best movies ever made about politics, right? Where one of the presidential candidates says, I'm not going to turn my nose up at a good idea just because I didn't think of it first. Right? A good manager or a good group will say it doesn't matter who's bringing forward the idea if the idea looks like it's going to help. Some people will feel threatened. Some people will view it as an implicit critique of the way they've been running meetings up until that time, which it might very well be. That one you're going to have to decide case by case. Bringing things in a little bit at a time rather than wholesale works a lot better. Okay. And Sarah's asking, is this a 60 minute or 90 minute session? Um, I have no idea. Um, it's in my calendar for 90 minutes, but it is now two minutes past the hour. If you all want me to give you back 28 minutes of your life, I'm happy to do that. Can anybody offer some guidance? Emily, do we know if this was a 60 or a 90? Uh, I actually don't know. Okay. Well, it looks like things are, uh, yep, it looks like things are slowing down a bit online. Um, you know, people keep using that word wisdom and my family laughs. I am Greg, well, I am GV Wilson at thirdbit.com. If you got anything you want to follow up with, I'm always happy to hear new suggestions, new ideas. If you've got techniques that help your meetings run more smoothly that you think could be transferred, please share them with me. I'm always looking for new ideas. If you have horror stories that you want to anonymize a little bit that I can then share with people, always look for those as well. Otherwise, I'd like to thank the Carpentries for giving me a chance to ramble on and I'd like to thank you all for taking part. It was good to see you all. All right. Well, thank you so much, Greg. Um, and thanks all of you for joining us today. Um, I'd like to remind you um, that there is a feedback survey that's in the etherpad. So if you have a few moments, um, you're welcome to fill that out. Um, and yeah, that, that's it for me. So thanks everyone for joining us. And, thanks again, today, to, Greg. and thanks again to Emily for hosting us all. Round of applause for Emily. And Greg. <laughs> Thank you. Take care, everybody. We'll see you online. Thanks.